Hey, let's give it up for all of those who are getting baptized today. Come on. I love the t-shirts, Raised to New Life. Uh, if you're new to our church, uh, the mission of our church is that uh, more people would find new life in Jesus. And so when we find new life, it's a declaration uh, that, man, to our friends, to our family members, to our church members, that we serve a great God. And we want to declare that. And so our God is good. But welcome all you guys who are here. We want to welcome those in our family venue, uh, those that may be listening online. Uh, but it's funny, I almost did not make it to church today, uh, not because my car broke down or any of that, uh, but on Friday, my wife almost went, we almost had our fourth kid on Friday. And so we've got a seven-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. And so Friday, we were at the hospital, and we were there from like 12 to 5, and we thought the baby was going to come. For those moms who have given birth, when you think the baby's going to come and the baby don't come, <laughs> Right? There's a problem. And so my wife, you know, I messaged her, and she's like, I, she's ready. She's ready for the baby to come. And um, her line that she uses with me now is, I have evicted the baby. He just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> um, and so uh, she is ready for that baby to get out. If you've ever had a kid, I get it. You know it. My wife has gone through four um, pregnancies through the summer, and so blessings on her heart. Amen? Right? Uh, so little Leo is going to come at some point. Uh, but today we are continuing our series on wisdom for everyday life. I don't know about you, but I know for myself that this, these messages, the last seven, six weeks, we're on our seventh week right now, have really challenged me to dig deeper in this area of wisdom that's applicable to our everyday lives. And so as we're thinking about wisdom, I want to encourage you that each and every one of us need it. But what happens a lot of times in life is we don't apply the wisdom that's given to us to our everyday lives, hence to series, Wisdom for Everyday Life. And as we have two more weeks to come, uh, Pastor Doug will be here and then Pastor Ben will close out our series. I want to encourage you that God is going to do some great and phenomenal things. And I want to encourage you to apply it to your life. And so what I want you to do is I want you to look, look at your neighbor and tell them, you need some more wisdom. Go ahead. It's okay. In love. In love. Do it in love, guys. No judgment. In love. All right, some of you guys are saying it too many times. All right, bring it back in. <laughs> bring it back in. But when we, we look at who we are to follow, which is Jesus, Luke uh, 2, 42 would tell us that Jesus grew in wisdom and in knowledge and in stature and in favor with God. And so when we're looking at that, we realize that the very man we're called to follow daily sought out wisdom, but the Bible would say that he was fully God and fully man. And so as an example for us, he sought wisdom daily. And so even though we made a joke about it, we all need some more wisdom. We all need some more wisdom. It's funny, as we're closing out this series, I don't know if you realize it, but the summer is almost over. You might feel like the summer flow, just flown by. It's just, it's gone. It came and gone. Uh, maybe you guys did your vacations at the beginning of the summer. Maybe you still got one more in you. But the summer is almost over, and I know there's some people in here that are sad because maybe you're on your parents' couch right now, and you got to go back to school, and the parents are happy because you don't have to feed them anymore, right? Get out. Um, but I think there's another group of people, all my moms in here or dads who've got kids in elementary school age or younger, right? They're getting ready to go back to school, 14 days for some of us. I know some of you moms are counting down the days. You don't have to, you know, no condemnation. Uh, but I know you're counting down the days. But we're ready for them uh, to head out. But today, as we're clo getting close to closing out the series, I want to encourage you that Today's message, I believe, is important for each and every one of us because it's going to answer some vital questions. And so where we're going to begin is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 48. And before we move into that, I want to encourage you with this. There's a lot of, I see a lot of young people in here and also older people, not old, older, amen, right? No one's old in here. And this word is applicable to our everyday lives. As we walk through a society that wants to tell us that the Bible is not 
God's word or the Bible, the things within the Bible are, are ancient and old or not, or not applicable for now, I wanna encourage you that this book is powerful. And so if we left the message today with this fact, I'd leave you with the fact that, man, open the book. Can we say open the book? Open the book. Ever had a book on your shelf that you've been saying you're gonna read, but you don't read it? All that wisdom that's in there, you can't get it. And so just so you know, the Bible doesn't like just speak to you, you know, right? God will speak, but it will speak to you if you'll read it, amen? So we open it up. So today we're gonna open it up and we're gonna go to Matthew chapter five. And so if you got your Bible with you, you can open it there or you'll see it on your notes uh, or on the screen. And so at this time, we find Jesus giving his first sermon, which is called the Sermon on the Mount. And so one chapter previous to this, uh, Jesus comes on the scene and he finds some men on an ocean bank fishing and he calls them to be his disciples. And so just as he called them to be his disciples, we have that same call to follow Jesus. Do you all know that we're called to follow Jesus? Right? Amen. Another amen. Right? Amen. And so in the midst of following Jesus, we're at this place in this message where Jesus is beginning to declare a value system that's opposite of our society. And so just like these disciples who were there at the time when Jesus was speaking this message, we as his disciples, he's speaking to us also. So I'd encourage you today to pray for eyes to see and ears to hear all that God wants to speak to you. And so we find ourselves here in chapter five, verse 38. And Jesus says, you have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Can we just wait for a moment? Now, I know we all Christians in here, some of us may not be Christians yet, but you're gonna become a Christian today because this is a day of salvation, amen, right? And let's be honest, this is crazy, come on. If somebody slapped you in the face, are you gonna turn and say, hey, slap my other one? Come on, slap, just keep on slapping, I wanna be slapped. But it's funny because we serve a God who, who's declaring a value system that's so opposite to our nature and what the world tells us, but it's so important for our everyday lives in declaration of who God is. And so we find Jesus at this time beginning to uh, declare something new on the scene, not changing God's word, but bringing meaning to, meaning to it in a way that could be sometimes difficult, but is important. So he goes on to say here, if you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. It's fun. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. I know some of you guys are thinking, well, I'm not, I don't have to worry about that. If your boss that you don't like tells you to do something you don't want to do, do more things you don't want to do, right? Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. He goes on to say here in verse 43, and this is where it gets a little bit stronger. He says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy. If you got a pen and you got notes, why don't you just underline that? But I say, love your enemies. And next to that, I'd ask you to circle this. He says, pray, just circle pray. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children your father, of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on both the just and the just, unjust alike. He goes on again in verse 46, he says, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? <laughs> Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. 
when you pray with me. God, uh, as we go through this message here for the next few moments, I ask that you would open our hearts to you, God. Let us hear your voice. Help us to see you. And God, will give you all praise and all honor. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at this passage, I can't go through everything on here, but he begins with this thought of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so if you go back into uh, the time 2,000 years ago, when, when they hear this verse, they're thinking back to the Old Testament where it's talking about, man, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You need to repay back the person who's hurt you. I'm sure we've all heard this before, but the funny thing is if you actually study it, it never meant that. Back in the Old Testament, it meant to take someone to court, not to take revenge. And I'm just gonna pause. Do you know what revenge is like, or anger? Anybody ever been angry before? It's okay. Pastor Ben is looking, but it's okay. There's still love here. But let me ask it this way. How many of you guys have ever been on a vacation here recently, a cool place, yeah? Uh, one of the first things you do when you go on vacation is you grab a suitcase and you pack it, right? Uh, my wife is pregnant right now, and so when we went somewhere, I'm the one that, you know, packed for our three kids. Uh, but then I forgot stuff. Any husband in here ever packed something and forgot it, right? So I forgot it. And, and then she was, you know, a little bit frustrated with me. But then I thought, you know, I didn't say it, but I thought if you would have packed it, then we wouldn't have forgot it, right? No, I'm just joking. I didn't say that. But, but you pack your suitcase. Don't tell her I said that. You pack your suitcase and you take your luggage with you so that you don't forget it. Right, Because if you're missing things outside of your suitcase, uh, then you're going to have to go buy it or your wife's going to be mad at you because you didn't pack it. I forgot to pack our kids um, those, those uh, night diaper thingies. Bad. That was a bad choice. And when we think about anger and frustration and, and uh, people who have wronged us, you know what that's like? It's like us taking each of those offenses and we throw it into a suitcase and we drag it along through our lives. No one ever dragged around hurt or dragged around pain, right, or things within you that you've been dealing with that you've just been holding on to? And what happens with that is every wrong, every hurt, every pain affects those who are closest to us. Anyone ever have something bad happen to you during the day and you get home and you take it out on the ones you love the most, Right? And that's what it is. And so Jesus, understanding that, is trying to show us a better way to live. He's trying to show and exemplify for us that when we are hurt and we hold on to it, all it does is destroy and hurt the relationships that are closest to us. And so a prime example of being able to overcome evil with love is Corey Ten Boom. I don't know if you've ever heard of her before. But she was in the Nazi concentration camp with her family. And at that time, it was her and her mom and her dad and I think some of her siblings. And most of her family members were killed. And outside of it already being devastating and already being overwhelming, having the ability to say, God, why? To hate and to, ang to have anger for people. As she grew, she began to lecture on this idea of grace. And here at our church, you'll know that one of our values is extravagant grace. But So she goes around and she's speaking at conferences or speaking at churches about this idea of grace. And at the end of one of these lectures, a man comes up to her at the end to shake her hand. But as she sees him, pictures come back in her mind and she realizes that this is the very man who took part in killing her family and more specifically her sister. And at that moment, she had to make a decision. Am I going to allow the very thing that I've been speaking about to guide my heart, or am I going to be overcome with anger? I think we'd all be honest that a guy who killed someone in your family came up to you. You'd be okay with just saying, I'm, I, I, I can't offer this grace. But it's funny, it says that as at the moment this happened, she had this split um, conversation with God where she asked him to love through her. I think there's times in our lives when we feel like we can't love those who have wronged us. We allow God to love through us. Amen? 
So today's message title, you'll see it on your notes, is Wisdom While Being Wrong. I think we'd all agree that we would love to have an understanding or the, the tools in our tool, tool belt to um, love those who've wronged us, to have wisdom on, on how to handle situations with people who have wronged us. And so today I hope to answer a few questions, questions like, how do I value and show value to someone who's hurt me or family member? Your other uh, question I hope to answer is, man, how can I hope for the best in someone when they've created and done things to me that are bad? Created circumstances that I now have to deal with for life. And the bigger question is, man, how do I treat someone who I hate or I, I don't like right now or who's treated me wrong? I think it's safe to say, and I can say it for myself first, that when people hurt us, we want them to get what they deserve. That's me. Anyone agree? That's you too, right? And, and so we have to ask ourselves this question, what is God trying to speak to us in the midst of understanding that he's calling us to love, but circumstances push us to hate? I'm going to give you wisdom insight number one. You'll find it in your notes. But do not rejoice when those who have wronged you get what you believe they deserve. Do not rejoice when those who have wronged you get what you believe they deserve. This is what Proverbs 24, 17 says. Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice or the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath from them. I said this a little bit earlier, but there's a value system that God has placed on us as his disciples. But here's the great thing about God. He doesn't condemn us. Aren't you happy about that? I love Romans 8 where it says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so as we're speaking about this topic right now, I think we'd all agree that we've dealt with this or are dealing with it, and God's not judging us because we're not perfect with it. Anyone here say, I'm not perfect with this, but I wanna learn how to be better, right? And so we all desire to be better uh, with this topic. And when I think of this topic, it reminds me of a story uh, in my own life with my sister. So I've got a sister, her name is Zakia. She is beautiful and single, uh, super, super awesome. Uh, got a great job in Allentown, Pennsylvania. She's a, she works at a, uh, as a lead designer at a, a church there. And if I can be honest, we were not always close. Anybody ever fight with your brother or si siblings? or had a sibling that wanted to follow you everywhere you went. That was my sibling. And she wanted to follow me everywhere I went. And um, at age 13, my parents made a decision to become foster, foster parents. And at that time, they had such a heart for youth and young adults that they chose to, to work with those kids who this was their last stop. And so if you know anything about foster kids at the last stop, that's like before you head the juvie. And so that was my parents' heart. And so after doing it for three years at age 16 for myself, my sister began to become very clingy to me. And as a cool 16-year-old, right? Any cool 16-year-olds in here? I see you, 15, I see you, yep. Um, you know, you want, your, you want your sibling to be like, can you get, like, back up? You know, I'm trying to, the ladies over here, you're my sister, I don't want them to think, you know. Anyway, and, and so we, uh, we go through life and we, we uh, get a little bit closer and, she came to live with us a few times, and there, one time she came to live with us, her and my wife were not seeing eye to eye. I don't know if you ever had that with your siblings and uh, special other people in your life, but we weren't seeing eye to eye, and, or they were not, and my wife was like, she's got to go. And, um, and so as a good husband, I should have said, whatever you say, but I'm a grace guy, and I'm like, hey, you know, and she was, you know, so we went through all of that, and so we have a, maybe you've had these conversations before, a come to Jesus talk. Right, And so we sat down, we had to come to Jesus, talk as a brother. I said, look, you about to get kicked out, girl. You don't know it, okay? You need to change. And, um, and so we're talking, and she, at this time, she's, she's, she's on drugs, she's drinking, not like in a way where she can't do stuff, but just she's just out there. Her life is spinning out of control. And so we have this conversation, and we're talking, and she begins to ask me all these why God questions, why is he allowing this to happen, and this to happen, and this to happen. And then she says something that transforms and changes our lives forever. She said, 
Man, you remember those, the time when uh, I wanted to be around you all the time? She said, it's because you were the only brother that I felt safe around. And what was happening was those foster kids were abusing her. And so in the midst of this conversation that we're having right now, I want to encourage you with, none of our staff members or our church are telling you that if you're in a situation that's a, where you're being abused or anything like that, that we're saying stay in it, okay? You need to call the popo, right? Kick them out. Um, but in this situation, I remember as a pastor thinking, man, how do, I, how do I deal with this? How do I reconcile my love for God and my hate for these boys who took advantage of my sister? And I think each and every one of us would have times in our lives where we see people do this, we see God asking us to do this, and we're saying, how do we, how do we reconcile this? How do we, how do we do what's being asked of us? And so we're all here today to gain some wisdom, right? Um, and so in the midst of that, I want to give you guys five simple points about this. And before I do that, I want to give you wisdom insight number two, and that's seeking to get even is like throwing coals with your hands. Does that make sense? Seeking to get even is like throwing coals with your hands. And what I mean by that is whenever you're angry or whenever you're frustrated and you're seeking to re re get revenge, wouldn't you agree that it hurts you also? Right? There's people that you want to, you wanna, that they're worse for them, and they, they could care less about you. Right? Ever been there? They could care less of what you're dealing with, and you are holding on to this and dragging this baggage around, and all it's doing is hurting you and your family members and your friends and your work relationships. And so next point here, you'll see it on your notes. Love and value everyone above yourself. I want to encourage you today that as you're dealing with this and as we look at what Jesus says here in Matthew 5, and in the midst of us being wrong, he would call us to love and value everyone above ourselves. For being honest, that's difficult because we've got our rights and things that we feel like are just and we've got our honor, but God is calling us to care more about his honor than our own, to care more about loving than hating. But here's the great thing, which is the next one under, is trust God with all your hurts. Trust God with all your hurts. Encourage you today that our God is trustworthy. Anybody know God's trustworthy? Right? God is trustworthy. He may not come or uh, do exactly what you want him to do when you want him to do it, but our God is trustworthy. I heard that one amen back there. Amen. I know it's hard. Amen. He's trustworthy. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, so the question I want to answer for you guys is how do we value, how do we love and value people who have wronged us. I know for myself I needed to know this, and I think as we go throughout life daily and weekly and throughout our lives, we need to think, God, how can I love and value someone who I believe does not deserve it, who I believe should be hurt for what they've done to me? So point number one would be this. Live a selfless and humble life. I know you're probably thinking, Ray, what does, that, what does me have to do with them? Why are you call, telling me to live a selfless, humble life? Anybody here married and you've served your husband or wife even when they didn't deserve it? Come on, right? Or want to be served more, right? I think we'd all agree that marriage is better when we serve. If you're here and you're still youth or young adult and you're frustrated with your parents and they're asking you to do something you don't want to do, and you make a decision not to do it, and you know you should do it. I saw that little knob right there. Get him, Dad. Get him. When we serve, it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with them. And if we begin this conversation with this understanding that we're called to live a selfless life, you know what that means? Our life is no longer about us. Our life is no longer about us. And so when things happen to us and we're frustrated and overwhelmed and stressed, God is saying, look, live a selfless life, always serve, but always trust me with your problems. And so you're saying, Ray, people don't deserve it. I'm gonna read this passage, Philippians 2, 3 through 4, and it says, instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourselves. 
we can be honest, it's very difficult to treat people more important than ourselves. It goes on and says, each, each of you should be concerned not only about your own interest, but about the interest of others as well. But Ray, they don't deserve it. But Ray, they've done this to me. And so that's where point number two comes in. Love those who don't deserve it. Love those who don't deserve it. And the reason why we can love those who don't deserve it is because we're loved by a God and we don't deserve it, right? I don't know about you, but I'm crusty and stinky. I smell okay though, but I'm crusty and stinky. I'm a sinner, but the Bible says I'm saved by grace, right? And so in the midst of that, it's so difficult to love those who don't deserve it, but we serve a God who loves us and we still don't deserve it. Anybody still do stuff you know you shouldn't be doing? Right? You ain't got to raise your hand. Just, you know, you can amen in your heart. And when we look at this passage and these passages and Jesus is speaking, he's calling us to love those people who we don't feel deserve it. And he wants us to follow the example that he set forth for us because we don't deserve it. The Bible would say that he loved us while we were yet sinners. He died for us, right? And so that's the type of God that we serve. And it's funny, Paul, who's one of the most phenomenal Christians in the Bible, wrote a ton of the scriptures in there, writes this passage in Romans 7 where he says that the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I do, I don't want to do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? If Paul was a wretched man, we probably wretched too, right? And so Paul is speaking and he's saying, man, like I'm doing things I know I shouldn't do. But then he understood the power of grace. And I'd encourage you to, in, to understand the power of grace, which will lead us to point number three. And I can have the worship team come up. And it's let limitless grace guide your heart. When envy and anger and pain wants to clog our hearts right, when it wants to destroy our relationships, when it wants to take from us our joy, allow limitless grace to guide your heart. Why should you do that, you ask? Because that's what God did for us. And if we continue to pull around the suitcase full of envy and full of rage and revenge and hurt, in pain, it actually only hurts us. True? And it hurts our kids. True? True? And our relationships and how we work and how we love. And so Jesus understanding all of that, that is communicating that I have a better life for you. I have a better life for you. If you will allow limitless grace to guide your heart, I've got a better life for you. Because life is better when you're not walking around angry at people, right? Life is better when the people who have hurt you don't cause you to hurt the people who are closest to you. And so Jesus, understanding that, is calling us to trust in him, to lay it at his feet so that you can live a better life. I don't know about you, but I want to live a better life. I don't want to allow the people who have hurt me to now hurt my family through me, right? To hurt my, my job or my career through me because I haven't let that go and I'm just carrying the suitcase of envy, and hurt, and pain around with me. I think some of you tonight, I mean, today is going to need to open that suitcase, dump that stuff out. Maybe just burn the suitcase. Can we just burn it? We just burn the suitcase. Because I promise you, when you do that, your life will be better. This is what Matthew 18, 21 and 22 says. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. It's funny. We think we understand Jesus and then he just takes things to the next level, right? So Peter, as he's writing or talking to Jesus about this, he's thinking, oh, if I, if I forgive someone seven times, they've slapped me seven times. Now I can slap him back, right? And Jesus changes it and says, not seven, but 70 times seven. What he's saying there is 
don't stop forgiving. And so in order for us to to not stop forgiving, we got to make a choice to number four, trust that God is just. Trust that God is just. You have to make a decision to say, can I trust that God is faithful? Can I trust that he will do better for me than I can do for myself? Can I trust that in the midst of my hurt and pains, he can avenge me better than I can avenge myself? And so I'm going to trust that God is just. Can you say that with me? Trust that God is just. Say it one more time. Trust that God is just. Now, sometimes it takes a little bit longer for things to get in our minds, right? So let's say it one more time. Trust that God is just. So you know what you just declared? You just declared that you're going to trust in the justice of God. You just declared that even though I've got hurt and I've got pain and I've got trials or tribulations or struggles that I'm dealing with, I'm going to allow myself to trust in a God that's just. So I'm going to live a selfless life before God. I'm going to love those who don't deserve it. I'm going to let limitless grace guard my heart, and I'm going to trust that God is just. And let's be honest, that is difficult, right? It's difficult and hard to trust in God when you feel like he's nowhere to be found. When you feel like that person who's been mean or that business person that keeps Uh, committing the same crime over and over again and it never gets better. How can you trust in the fact that God is just when he keeps allowing this to happen? We don't know how we can trust that God is just and trust in him and forgive like him because he's done it for us. The Bible would say that if we're not willing to forgive, he's not willing to forgive us. And so the last thing that you'll see up here Psalms 33, and it says, it's not up there. There it is. For the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. We can trust everything that he does. Because God is just. So the last thing on your notes is let go and let God. What if today... We could leave here without the pain and the hurt that has wrecked our relationships. Would you want that, right? What if we could leave here letting go of that suitcase that we've dragged around for some of us for years upon years and it's continued to affect us and affect the way we treat people. What if we could let that go and allow God to change them and to fill us? The Bible says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And the only reason why I can live this out, the only reason why I was able to forgive these foster kids for me or any other person that's hurt me is because I know that God has forgiven me so much. Because we said it earlier, we're crusty. I'm crusty. I've got problems. And I love Psalms 103, 12, where it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. It's a little lesson. You guys know how far the east and the west is from? They don't touch, right? He's removed our sins, our issues, our hurts against him, our wrongs against him, as far as the east is from the west. And so if we have a God who would forgive us so much, can we not give the same to those who are in need of Jesus? Can we not allow our lives to be better because we're not going to allow it to be destroyed by our hurts and our pains and our issues and our problems? And so right now I want to encourage you as we get ready to go into baptisms and people are going to get baptized who have been raised to new life. As they're going